The year is 2012. The game Slim of the Eight Pages was published and takes over the internet like a phone. Thousands of people across the world flock to the game, seeing their favorite YouTubers play it. The game was free and was very simple, and yet it was terrifying to most people. People all around the world were getting nightmares from this tall, pale creature. Videos like animations, parodies, and how they had seen Slenderman in real life flooded the internet. What is that? It's a big dick. It was an historical moment in YouTube culture. It was a golden age. Blue Owl Studios, the mastermind behind this game, would then go on to make the sequel, Slender the Arrival, which would make an even bigger audience. And if you've been on YouTube since 2012, there was no way you haven't heard of this guy. And even though Slender the Arrival and its ancestor only made 100,000 copies, millions and billions of people have heard of this creepypasta and its games. Bruh. And with that being said, I think it's safe to say that Slender the Eight Pages and the Arrival was a massive success. Months later, many parodies and mods were created, you replicating Slender the Eight Pages, just with a different theme. And although it was blatant copying, this made the Slender community a lot more stronger. Games like Slendy Pants, Shrek Sim, like and Slender Space just made the game a lot more enjoyable. It made our favorite characters we used to love as children in TVs into horrifying monstrosities. What? And yet, one game stuck out. This game would go on to be one of the most popular Sony games for its time and would go on to turn this indie game into a full-fledged series that is still being worked on to this day, getting millions of views on YouTube. And that game is... Yeah, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna have to give this game a, a zero out of hundred worst game ever. Made on December 2012, made by Zealworks, does exactly as the title says. It's Slender the Pages, full of Teletubbies. <laughs> Instead of Pages, you have Custards. How do I How do I get you? Instead of Slenderman, you have Tinky Winky. Don't give him the damn satisfaction. <laughs> and instead of a normal forest, you were in the mainland. And although Bruh. simple. The tension that the monster could be anywhere was terrifying. In Slender Tubbies, you can't see that far compared to the original. In Slender, you could barely move and your flashlight would eventually die. But here, you can run extremely fast with unlimited battery. And instead of 8 custards, you had to find 10. The AI is very different compared to the original. As soon as you started the game, Tinky Winky already is going after you, whether you collected a custard or not. And even though the map is huge and you can't see that far, Tinky Winky always knows where you are and will go after you no matter how safe you think you are. There are three modes in the game. Single player, multiplayer, and competitive for some reason? I mean, I don't think there's going to be an eSport about this game anytime soon, but whatever. In the multiplayer, you choose to either play with or against your friends, which was amazing. The original never had multiplayer, so not only could you play with your friends, you can also scare the living crap out of them. Yeah, they won't open the door! Ah! <laughs> Although there was only one map, there are three versions. Day, Dusk, and Night. Even though day and dusk would make the game less scary, quote unquote, the fog became a lot more visible, and you can just see how restricted you are to how far you can see. And since you can't see that far, Tinky Winky can come out of the fog at any moment and kill you. Similar to Slender the Eight Pages, as you collect more custards, Tinky Winky becomes faster. At two to one custards remaining, he becomes faster than you. There is also a lot of landmarks as well around the map to find these custards. You can find gigantic trees, a beach, the house, some weird lamppost thing that you see from the beginning of every Teletubby episode, and a cave. Zap! And yet, it wasn't enough. Yes, the game was creepy and was a creative Slenny Tubby's parody, but it was just too simple. There was nothing to keep it up. There was nothing to make it stand on its own two feet. Once you've played it twice, it just gets boring. Sure. Maybe you can play with your friends. Mi color. Eh, hoy, hoy así, hoy but after that, what's next to come? Well, on 2014, everything will change. Oh my god! Hey! What the f- ah! oh, He's up there! Ah! Oh my god! Ah! 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 Shit! Ah! 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 Oh my god! Ah! Oh my god! 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 O
They're racist. They're racist. Slendy tubbies. Uno. Trying to get that custard. Trying to get that applesauce. See, I am the boost. Ricky Rose. Cashy do his thing like every single day. These bitches trying to scare me. But it ain't Brandon, gonna happen, motherfucker. I you got until crunch, you. So you could Shit. call me Captain. May of 2014, the sequel to Slender Tubbies was released and is, in my opinion, the scariest Slender parody of all time. Everything from the monsters. $19 Fortnite card. Who wants it? And yes, I'm giving it away. Down to the maps, everything just clicked. And Pero although the game is flawed, Slender Tubbies 2 was at least 10 times more terrifying than the last game. The monsters were absolutely disgusting. From a headless dipsy that carries a chainsaw with him to the erratic twitching of Lala on the outskirts. This game was a parody paradise for horror. Every YouTuber I saw playing this game has gone scared one way or another, which is what I think makes an incredibly fantastic horror game. <laughs> Well, let's do ourselves a favor and step back and just see why this game was such a terrifying masterpiece as it is, starting with the monsters. The monsters in this game are just absolutely terrifying. Each variant is unique and stands out in their own way. Each monster has their own screams and behavior, and honestly, this was a good move. Because in Slender Tubbies 1, Tinky Winky was the only monster and everyone else was dead in very disgusting and awful ways. Poe was hanging from a tall tree with several scratch marks on her face. Dipsy was decapitated in the house with his face completely covered by blood, and Lala was stranded on a beach side with her eyes completely scratched out. But in Slender Tubbies too, they've come back alive and are desperately trying to kill you, so much so that they will guard any custard they see, blocking your progress. And again, the models are just terrifying. Let me explain. Dipsy's character has two versions of himself, one where there is a strong decapitated version of him, or the one that keeps his head and is much more taller. Tinky Winky on the other hand has consumed 35 steroids and is now a tank. He moves around using his arms in the front and behaves much like a gorilla. Wait, so does that mean that we've turned back to Monkey? Is Tinky Winky a monkey now? Poe is a more unique creature that now has blades on her shoulders and has two extra limbs sticking out of her chest. But I've saved my favorite for last, and that monster is Lala. Lala is an extremely tall and malnourished individual, roaming the wasteland while twitching erratically in all directions. She tends to make these very nerve-wracking noises, almost sounding as if she's in pain. Tell you to be custard. Um, this is gonna go absolutely batshit crazy! Hello? Is that you crying? Judging from the appearance, she is extremely hungry and is most likely suffering from starvation. <laughs> Now, remember how I said in the last game how her eyes were completely scratched out? Well, in here, she is now blind and can only find you by smell or sound. Now, honestly, I love monsters like these, seriously. Because even though they try to kill you and you are most likely terrified of them, it makes you extremely sad to see the state that they are in right now. And what I love here is how each monster's body corresponds with the maps. Lala is extremely skinny because she is in a wasteland, a place that is very scarce of food. Tinky Winky is now more of a gorilla because he's in a more overgrown and abandoned version of the mainland. Dipsy's second version of himself with his head on is now stranded on a lake, so he's most likely going to get his food from the fish that are in the waters. So he's adapted to the lake and now behaves more like a marine animal. And Poe is... Uh... Well... A necromorph from Dead Space. Now, before I talk about anything else, although these models are creepy, they were not created by Zeoworks. In fact, the animations weren't even shown by them. Poe is a necromorph from Dead Space, Tinky Winky is a modified version of the tank from Left 4 Dead 2, and if you look closely, you can even see the pants and the shoes. Lala is from an indie game called Donald Horror. Is it chasing me? <laughs> oh, and Dipsy is from Resident Evil 4. Frick, I'm out of ammo! Now, I have no idea if Zeoworks asked permission to use these models, or if the models are just allowed to be used, but I really hope they didn't just outright steal the models because, uh, well, that would be stealing. 
The maps are also really amazing as well. There's a wasteland with an incredibly ancient ruin of some building that Lala likes to spend her time in. There's the mainland, but now is more overgrown and is now like a swamp. Oh, uh, and there's also a Minecraft version of the mainland as well. Ugh. And it's not even the four Teletubbies that are chasing you anymore. No, 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 there are some other monsters that are chasing after you and that are completely original. There are these tubbies called the Newborns, and they mostly spend their time in a dark sewer system, where there is some it. weird advanced light. lab that is going on here, some Here's gamer dungeon probably, with there RTX is. keyboards. Now, from the looks of it, these are pods, and since there's only two of them, maybe these are where the two Newborns came from? Wait, 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 hang on. This game has lore? An actual story behind it? Slinny Tubby's lore? Well, from the looks of it, there is. But we're gonna talk about that later in a more relevant time. So for now, we're just gonna go on to the next thing. You can now customize how many custards you want, from 5 all the way to 25 custards, which is also really cool as well. There is now a fully developed lobbying system, enhanced graphics, and Minecraft. Minecraft. Tubbies 2 is a masterpiece that handles horror extremely well, and although the game is bugged out and has some questionable model usages, you 100% should give this game a go. Turn off your lights, get your headphones out, go to 100% volume, and play the game how it was meant to be played. What if I were to tell you that Slinny Tubbies 3 would have an hour-long campaign, a large community exclusively of five-year-olds populating the fan base, and American Teletubbies colonizing someone else's land for their oil? <laughs> On August 2017, the third game of Slinny Tubbies was released, and I'm gonna be honest guys, it it's not great. With Slinny Tubbies 1 having a very interesting parody to Slender Man, and Slinny Tubbies 2 carrying on its legacy, uh, Slender Tubbies 3 has story mode and gun. A quick disclaimer, the campaign is extremely flawful. Remember how I said in Slender Tubbies 2 how it was also flawed? Okay, now I want you to times that by, uh, I don't know, 10 billion? Add no barriers, add a gun, remove all horror elements, and that's Slender Tubbies 3. There are so many countless flaws within the game that if I were to talk about every single glitch, we would be here for hours. Now, I'm not gonna be too hard on these guys because not only has this game been worked on since February of 2015, the game is free. And from what I can tell, there's no ads, so this was strictly a passion project, but that doesn't stop it from being bad. Of course, it's not all bad. The music is pretty good. But the reason for my negativity about this game is just that it's just not scary. Not once was I startled, or was I screaming, or even jump scared in the entire game. Although there were some good moments, but more on that later. Before I even talk about the campaign, I need to say something first. Firstly, since my storage on my computer is all at red, I will be using gameplay made by Stormcast to use as footage. Stormcast is a pretty good channel, and the link will be in the description. And secondly, uh, that's it. On to the story. The campaign starts with an opening scene of Poe at the beach, admiring the view. Bruh. As she's admiring, Nunu comes and greets her. Five seconds into the game and we're already introduced to our first mechanic, choosing what you say. Slender Tubby's 3's gameplay is mostly choosing what you say, like in the Walking Dead games. What's Although this isn't really a bad thing. To be honest, there's nothing really to criticize here. It's a very calming introduction to the game and managed to have some pretty good character development for the first few minutes. When I said this game does have some good moments, this is one of them. Poe eventually returns to the house and we are now introduced to another opening shot of the mainland, showing a bunny along the way with HD gaming graphics. Shortly after that, we are now playing as our first character, Poe. The first moments of the gameplay are you talking to your friends, most notably the 14-year-old depressed TikTok girl that sat for no reason purple guy in the SoundCloud rapper. Fun fact, in the 2015 demo, everyone was two times more fuzzy and shiny. Thank god they removed that because it didn't really look good. They also added this Kinder Surprise Eggs level music. After you talk to your friends, you are now given your first objective. Cook food for everyone! <laughs> I 
Why, yes, the woman must do the labor, while Tinky Winky is king of them all. The way to cook food for them is to use this machine, but alas, it's broken. Dipsy tells you how to fix it by pressing that button and getting a wrench, and again, you have to do that all by yourself. When you eventually feed everyone their custards, they all decide that it's time to go to sleep. Poe agrees to get some rest, but however, this is the start of the infection. A few hours go by, and when everyone is asleep, Tinky Winky wakes up and breaks the fucking machine! Oh my god, do you know how long the woman had to take to fix that for you? Poe wakes up seeing Tinky Winky leave, and this is your first major choice that will affect the gameplay dramatically. Would you take Lala with you, or go by yourself? Now, I thought long and hard about this, and I decided that I will assume that you chose to go by yourself. Don't worry, when the choice comes to play and affects the gameplay, I'll tell the alternative of what would happen if you brought Lala. But for now, we're gonna assume that you went alone. After a painstakingly long time of walking and doing nothing, you have now finally found Tinky Winky, and oh no, he turns into the spooky monster. Oh no, he turned ugly and spooky. I also love the dialogue here. Poe just says, oh my god, and just runs. <laughs> As you are running, you are now back in control of the character. You must run back to the house and wake up your friends. But alas, they're fucking dead. When you realize that your friends have been deceased, a weird moment plays in this game that I just don't like. Basically, you have to click arrows to turn the direction that you need to go to. So for a few minutes, the game is just a click the arrow video game. At some point as she's running, Poe just locks herself onto something, and yet we can't seem to see it. That's because in the beta, there was originally a lamppost thingy there, and they just removed it and forgot to add it back. Oh my god. And this is truly just screaming in human reactions. Look at this. Yeah, did you know that Poe can fly? Bruh. All that effort to escape Tinky Winky unfortunately is all a waste of time because as soon as you see a tree that you somehow can't go around, you die. <laughs> Leaving chapter 1 to conclude. The game starts with a beeping sound saying that there is no signal. And here is where we play our main character, Walter White. Okay, okay, I want to call him that, but we're actually going to call him Guardian, okay? That, that's what he's called. As you've heard from the description, the Guardian's plan is to get to the satellite station for help. However, before he does that, he needs to get the night vision camera, which is for some reason sealed up in a metal door thingy. And now the game starts. The Guardian's workplace seems to be some sort of sewer system where he monitors the four main Teletubbies. To be honest, I actually really like the concept here. How the four main Teletubbies think they're living normal lives, only for them to not realize that they're actually being monitored. And also, I think now is an appropriate time to talk about another one of Sonitubby's mechanics. The camera. Inspired by Silent Hill's camera angles, I'm guessing they try to replicate this as well. But in my opinion, it really isn't necessary for all these camera angles. I'd much rather play this game in first person rather than third person. But again, that is just my opinion. I also really like how the first minutes of chapter 1 play out. You have to do a little puzzling and ingenuity to get to the night vision camera. Once you require the night vision camera, well, we have good news and bad news. Good news is, we're in first person. Bad news is... Yeah. Now that the lights turned out, we encounter our first enemy, the newborns. The concept of the newborns is actually pretty simple. They're slow and blind, so as long as you're not in their way of where they're going via being behind boxes, you should be alright. However, because they're really slow, some parts of this are just tedious, and if you die, you have to wait for the newborns to get out of your direct line of sight all over again. It's very simple, and I feel like there could have been more to this. I don't know, maybe you could have used the objects around you to make a sound to lure them away from you? Thankfully, this part is actually very short, and as long as you're patient enough, you can make it to the ladder hatch. When you escape the sewer system through the ladder, we enter the mainland by... Uh oh Alright. Now that the Guardian is outside, his next objective is to get custards from various locations for research. Now, I thought this was going to be the Slender the Arrival thingy, where as soon as it hits Chapter 2, it begins essentially doing the Slender the Eight Pages thing. But no, the game already tells you where all the custards are, and you only have to collect four of them. To be honest, I'm a little disappointed that this bit doesn't do the main premise of Slender Tubbies and Slender Man in general. Instead, it just feels like a chore to do because of how long it takes to get these custards. 
But I mean, I guess it's interesting in a way. You essentially explore the aftermath of what happened, and you figure out what happened to Poe. She fucking died. Once you are done collecting custards, you need to collect one more. But oh no! Tinky Winky is already there! The spooky man himself! And then some anime shit happens where the custard transforms into a super custard, and Tinky Winky consumes it from his chest, and oh no! He becomes the spooky tank from Left 4 Dead 2! Oh no! Now that all the custards are gone, we are now being chased by a fast, bulky, and strong purple guy, and you need to get out of there as fast as possible. And again, we have another major choice that will affect the gameplay. Will you go to the mountains, or the cave? And again, I'll eventually say what happens in both options, but we're gonna assume that you went into the mountains. Although Tinky Winky seems deadly, his attacks are very slow, so as long as you just run in a straight line, you should be fine. After about a minute or two of us running to the cave, we have now made it, concluding chapter one. Chapter 2 begins with us walking on the mountains. Now, this is the middle point of the game, and we are now halfway there to getting to the satellite station. Now, I really love how the mountains play out in this game. It's very atmospheric, and I feel like there should have been more areas for the player to explore here, because it seems very linear, and there's only a couple places you can explore. I also really love the ambience here. It just makes me feel like I'm actually there. We unfortunately can't see that far due to the amount of snow that is blowing in our face right now, but as we are walking, we seem to hear some talking. If we explore further, the talking gets louder and louder until... You proceed to get kidnapped by a spooky yeti nerd man. You can attempt to talk to the guy, but he will not respond. Time goes by, and when we wake up, we have no idea what has happened to us, but when we get a bearing of our surroundings, we see ourselves in this very unfamily-friendly place that is rated M for Mature. With the amount of blood diseases that we are contracting every second staying in the pit, it becomes very clear that this is a food chamber. Nonetheless, we walk out of the chamber to see a recently lit fire and a robot cutting a tree. I don't know what the intention of the robot is, but it seems to me that this metallic machine is supposed to be some sort of comedic relief, because of how casually he talks to you saying that you will be eaten by his master. Of course, the guardian is quite angry and he is having none of that, but the robot warns him. The robot says that if you escape, the Yeti will notice and will kill you, as well as the robot man himself. The Guardian advises him to escape with him, but he disagrees, and so our journey begins again. Now, Zealworks, you're probably not going to see this, but I would really love to see an option to keep the robot with you and make him follow us throughout the mountain part. That would have been really cool as the robot is a very chill and casual character. But of course, as we leave, the Yeti notices and is most likely ripping the robot apart, so we need to move fast. And now there's another part of the game that plays out that could have been interesting if it were more complex. Basically, we make a choice whether to go left or right, and it seems that the Yeti uses echolocation so he screams in random directions. Thankfully, we can hear whether the scream was left or right, so we need to make the choice of going the way that he didn't scream. Again, it's a neat concept, but I feel like it's a little too simple. Maybe he could have been chasing us while we were choosing, or how we could have gone first person and run wherever we liked. Thankfully, it's not that long, and we only have to do it like five times. Once we are out of reach of the Yeti's habitat, we can now leave the mountain through this gate. But alas, it's locked. But not only is it locked, we soon discover that we've lost our night vision camera. So we have to go back and find a camera and a tool to use to break the gate. By traversing through this gigantic ice lake, we eventually find our night vision camera. However, it is revealed that the screen is cracked. This is unfortunate, but beyond this discovery, we won't be exploring any other dark areas that require the night vision camera. Next, we need to find a tool, which could be found in the cabin. Thankfully, Jack Kell isn't in the cabin and it seems to be long abandoned. However, it has a tool that could be used to break open the gate. Once we go back through the lake and get to the gate, we unlock it and we are now free from the mountains. Finally, after a long journey through the mainland and the mountains, we have now reached the outskirts, and we can even see the satellite station from here. At this point in the game, we are reaching the final chapters of Sunatubbies 3. Now that we can be at the outskirts at dawn instead of nighttime like in the sequel, we can fully see how messed up the place is. It's an extremely dry and empty wasteland that is very scarce of life. I find it interesting how back at the mainland it's all colorful and has a living, breathing ecosystem. However, beyond that is a barren wasteland with only the cold, dark mountains to be as the barrier. 
as we are traversing through the mainlands, we see a fire. And here is where the choice of going alone or bringing Lala with you back at the mainland takes effect. See, because we went alone, although Poe and Dipsy died, Lala had enough time to escape Tinky Winky and somehow, by some luck, has ended up here in the outskirts. And we can even talk to her. She is obviously in a complete distressed state of what she has been through, and the Guardian tries to calm her down, which of course doesn't work. Lala keeps trying to ask who we are, and we have a little minor choice. We can tell her that he was the guy monitoring the Teletubbies, or we keep silent. Staying silent is probably the best choice, but if we were going to confess to Lala, we actually do have some interesting notes about the Guardian and his job. Confessing to Lala shows that the Teletubbies have tight security around the mainland, and had they explored beyond the mountains, they would erase their memories of the person that went to the mountain and bring him or her back to the mainland, and it turns out that Guardian is a partner alongside of Nunu. Of course, Lala is extremely mad at us and even swears at us, what a fucking saying that we knew the infection was going to start and that we are the ones to blame. But that's not even the most surreal part. The most surreal part is that you can punch her. How wholesome. After a while, we eventually calm Lala down by not hitting her, but to which she tells us that she is indeed eating a custard. Guardian tells her that the satellite station is most likely getting a cure, so we have to head there fast. Lala agrees, and we are now traversing through the ancient ruins. However, before we can get to the satellite station, we must collect some more custards for data. And as we are collecting custards, Lala warns the Guardian that she isn't feeling very good. Once we collect all custards and escape the ruins, Lala sits down. She can't walk anymore from the pain of the custard that she has consumed. Roll in the sad music gamers, because Lala is about to freaking die. You can attempt to get her up, but it's too late. She is about to transform into the spooky monster. What will you do? Will you end the suffering of her, or leave her to rot? Choosing either of these will make you feel cruel and evil, but the good choice is most likely ending your suffering, in which we do that with rock. Shut Fun fact, as I am recording this, I went down into the comment section of where Lala died, and a few, no, several people have explained that they have cried during the scene, I mean, I can sort of understand why, but I don't think this would cause me to burst down in tears. More of just a sad disappointment. And now it's time to tell you the other choice. See, if you were to bring the Teletubbies with you, most notably only Lala because Dipsy was too tired, she would come with you, but you would depart ways quite quickly by splitting up. After returning to the lake, she has been brutally murdered and scratched by Tinky Winky. And when we arrive at the ancient ruins, she's already infected, and we have to collect the custards while she is here. And to be honest, Zealworks finally did something that works. See, because she is blind, making any noise can make her come to us. And this is genuinely scary. The fact that we have to stay quiet and might not know where she is while we have to collect these custards is terrifying. Finally, Zealworks does something extremely well in this game. But now, we have finally arrived at the satellite station with no girlfriend. Concluding Chapter 2. The cave is the alternative option to escape Tinky Winky if you didn't want to go through the mountains. The cave is, well, a cave, with brown tarnished stone everywhere and seemingly random crystals all over the place. Oh, and uh, a little secret egg. The cave, in my opinion, is a really spooky place, as well as just caves in general in real life. Ever since I was a toddler, I always hated the caves. Just the idea of being trapped in a complete dark place and getting stuck in the really slim tunnels was just terrifying. I'm not sure why Zealworks didn't take advantage of that and make these really long, narrow hallways and really cramped and tight spaces, because instead the cave is actually pretty wide open and has a lot of places to move around. However, there are pages hinting at the fact that there might be something in here with you. If you go a specific way, you might find a collection of notes that look like they have been crudely drawn by a child. These are most likely diaries and journals of what they have seen in the cave, because whoever this guy is, was most definitely trapped in the cave. Eventually, the journal ends with paper torn apart and the words being more and more incoherent to the point where we don't even know what they're saying anymore. One thing that Zerox is good at is making side stories. I love to be in the cave only to find someone else just like us was entering it as well. A theory that I've seen by most people is that this individual is the friend of the pre-infected Yeti and that the Yeti was once a Teletubby that recently ate a custard. 
However, it becomes very apparent to whoever this individual is has in fact eaten the custard. You know, with all these infections happening, it just begs the question, why couldn't they just eat the Teletubby pancakes instead? You know, the ones with the smiley faces? Those are probably delicious. By the time the last page was drawn and torn apart, this is most likely them transforming into the spooky monster nerd man. This theory is confirmed by the sounds of strange and disturbing noises that we can hear. The gimmick with this part of Slim Tubby's 3 is that the cave is a maze, and we have to traverse through the cave without getting caught by the individual. I mean, I guess it's a good concept, but I'm not a big fan of mazes. And that's not even the terrible part. Once we get out of the maze, we have to do another click the arrow video game, which thankfully is shorter, but is also a little bit harder. We jump in some sort of water, and we escape the cave. When we escape the cave, instead of going down the mountain, we instead are in a valley, where we can see some sort of blood that confuses the guardian. Another theory that I've heard is that when Lala was escaping, she chose to go through the cave and managed to escape the monster, hence the blood, I guess. And again, Zeoworks is amazing at doing side stories. Based on logic, we can pinpoint that Lala would most likely die on the mountain, so she would have have to go through the caves. But one part of this that just breaks complete logic, like how Poe jumps really high, is this ledge part. We have to get up the valley, but once again, these Teletubbies have godly powers and can jump super high from rock to rock. If Lala's theory is correct, then she had to do this as well. And Teletubbies just jump really high in general? I mean, in the actual show, they themselves jump really high, so maybe it's not broken logic, but their biology. Maybe they just have some really strong legs. Once we get up here, it just becomes the outskirts like in the mountains again, so we shall now move on to the satellite station. Finally, after many infections, characters, puzzles, and hardships, we have finally arrived at the satellite station. At this point in the game, we are now on the final chapter of Slinitubbies 3, and the campaign is coming to a close. The satellite station is a base out in the middle of the outskirts, mostly buried under the mountains, and according to the Guardian, the people working at the station have already developed a cure. I mean, COVID took like 9 months of it being around to finally get a cure, so how could these guys get a cure to stop an ongoing infection in just a day? We get to the entrance of the satellite station, but alas, it's locked, so you have to go around the side to do a little puzzle solving. Switching a lever will affect the other levers, so you have to somehow get them all aligned. Once you get them aligned, the gates opens, and we now enter the station. Upon entering the satellite station, we are not greeted with Teletubbies everywhere working doing their own thing. Instead, we enter the station to see a cold, dark hallway with a very eerie ambience. This outright tells the Guardian that something isn't right. In case you didn't know that this place feels off, don't worry, there's a dead corpse here with a very unfamily friendly rated M for mature gore laying on the ground. The note reads, get out while you still can. How original. The satellite station seems to have some extremely advanced material everywhere with advanced gates, advanced computers, and even lasers for security. Have Teletubbies outsmarted humans to the point where they can just build this kind of stuff? I mean, they don't even have any fingers, so this is pretty impressive. Now, unfortunately, this game having camera angles, this area is the worst offender. I mean, just look at this. It's very clear that the satellite station was not designed for this kind of mechanic. It's a very claustrophobic place with many sharp turns and corners. I really don't know why they didn't consider going first person here. Another thing that I don't understand with the satellite station is the complete overhaul. In Slinitubbies 2, it was way more cooler with blue line thingies going up and down on the walls. Look at this one. What is that? Is that a giant robot? <laughs> so I don't know why they got rid of that. But whatever, let's just see what the story is all about in this place. All these corpses that we see as we are walking through the station are all Shut blue people. Now, I probably know why they didn't include more variety of Teletubbies here. Budget. But I would really like to see them add more Teletubbies here and not just blue nerds. Speaking of blue nerds, one of them is actually alive. You could talk to the nerd who is named Ron. Ron tells you that Dipsy entered the satellite station with a spooky chainsaw and started going for the 20 kill streak in Call of Duty. Ron was caught but managed to escape alive, hence the reason he's all beaten up. Eventually, Ron devises a plan for Guardian. There's a key card past the door that will allow him to get through the control panel where we can call the military for help. But you must go through the vents as the door is locked. So we go through the vents, which could have made a good scary moment like if there's a monster <laughs> in the vents, but no, there's no creatures in here. So when we get out of the vents and get the key card, oh no, the stupid nerd blue butthead man is dying from Dipsy's chainsaw. Y'all hear something? We try to help him by getting back to him, but he's already dead with, again, more rated M for mature gore that the kids aren't allowed to see. Guardian doesn't seem to give a crap, though, because now that we have the key card, we go to the locked door. 
However, before we go through it, oh no, he has gone insane, and he sees Teletubbies everywhere. After a few drug doses, Dipsy with chainsaws coming for us, and oh no, we have to get back to the laser to kill him. The chase begins, but chances are you probably might not get this first try because you probably don't even know where you're going because of all these camera angles. Again, this is the worst offender, and it doesn't help that we're being chased by a spooky man. Why can't we just go to first person? This is so bad, oh my god. Eventually, we get to the laser, and Dipsy dies and explodes. However, his chainsaw is still intact, and we grab it. After we grab the chainsaw, we go back to the door to unlock it, into which we find Nunu? Guardian wonders why Nunu is in here, but oh no! He was the traitor all along! He confesses to the Guardian that he made the Cussers infected with COVID-3000. His reasoning behind this? Teletubbies are weak. After this stunning confession, he just walks away. As he walks away though, the lamppost thingy that he was next to turns into the super lamppost thingy. And then some heavy metal rock music plays with lyrics included and we now have to do a battle. Now, there's a lot of things to talk about with this thing. From the loud copyrighted heavy metal music to the fact that we're fighting a boss with a laser gun. Uh, remember when this game was about horror and dread? Yeah, me neither. We have to kill this guy with a chainsaw, and our controls are ducking and blocking, walking, dashing, etc. Now, there is a bit of strategy to kill this boss, but all of this is unnecessary. It just feels off for a game like this. Just 20 minutes ago, I was talking about how Slimitubbies 2 was a masterpiece of horror, and now we're here. How? I can't even say this boss is short. This is actually quite a long boss, and you might not even defeat it first try. When you do eventually kill the lamppost thingy, you go to the panel and ask the military for help, and then we proceed to chase down Nunu and stop him. We return to the outskirts that day, just in time to stop Nunu. Nunu tries to convince us into joining him. He explains that his newborn army is attacking everything as we speak, and that he injected a virus into the machines that create said newborns. Leaving him or joining him, we'll say both choices, but we're gonna say nah. Nunu gets angry at us and summons the Red Nerd Man, and it turns out that Poe was alive. Well, kind of. We have to do another boss fight, and we have to kill Poe again. And this is twice as long. This boss does as well require some strategy, and you might not get it first try due to the many phases she goes through. Her first form is her normal form, but at around half health, she turns into the spooky man with blades. And around a quarter of her health left, she becomes a fucking scorpion. The first ending we get is by losing to Poe's third phase. If she kills us, the military comes to see us dead on the ground. They try to figure out what happened and why he's dead, but the newborn army comes and trying to steal their stinky V-Bucks. The next ending is when you agree to joining Nunu. He introduces you to the custard factory where all the custards are made. We are required to jump into the custard pit, and if we do, we turn into the spooky monster. The third ending is when you join Nunu, but you refuse to jump into the pit. Poe comes to you and cuts half of your legs off, making you a monster with no legs. However, when we kill Poe, we achieve the good ending. When Poe dies, we walk up to Nunu and saw him to death. The military comes in which we are greeted to Sergeant Miles. We attempt to explain the situation to him, but his partner warms him of something he saw. They go up a small hill and... And... HOLY SHIT! Now, wait, 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 don't leave the video just yet, it's not done, it's actually far from done. So that was the campaign. The campaign, in my opinion, was just really bad, it was buggy, slow, and just kind of sucked all around. But this game took two years to make, so I have to respect them for trying. Even if it was bad, it was made with lots of passion and love. I don't know what I'm doing! And hey, I guess it explains how everyone got infected. But what else is there? Well, there's an anniversary edition of Slinitubbies 1 that ups the graphics by a lot. Uh, um, uh, un unless you're playing on, on mobile. Hello, your computer has virus. And well, originally there was going to be a sequel, or more accurately, a DLC, that was supposed to be Chapter 4 of the series, but that was cancelled. However, in 2015, Zworks made a side game along the way to further expand on the Slinitubbies genre, which was Slinitubbies 2D. It was Sonitubbies, but no longer free. Stop posting! The game features all the maps we know and love, like the sewers. However, hear me out. This game is broken. Horribly, horribly broken. 
first off, if we go to the secret lair and take a passageway to the left, we can literally go out of the map and enter the void. Some maps in the game allow chatting, while others don't. And the strangest part about this is that on the maps that you can chat, the monster can see you chat, but not yourself. Furthermore, if you go to the maps that you can't chat in, sometimes the monsters won't even be there, specifically in the multiplayer. If the owner of the server starts on, let's say, the school, they will see the monster, but no one else will. So it results in this. And this one is really something. If you go into the mountains and find the Yeti, the Yeti will chase after you, but if you walk, it will walk with you. Other than that, there's not really much to talk about this game. The most interesting part is how broken and glitchy it is. Although I did stumble upon a very toxic couple on a server, so that was interesting. I mean, this game isn't even it's so bad it's good. However, a game that is so bad it's good is the Slinitubbies 3 multiplayer. Like the campaign, the game is very glitchy, but it is a lot of fun. Oh, hi. 360 Moscow! In all of the previous multiplayers, it only had versus and co-op. However, there is a game mode that is called Survival Now, where you literally have a gun. The game mode is heavily inspired by Killing Floor. The premise of the game is that there is a breach of specimens and a group of people have to kill them in waves. Survival Mode does the exact same thing, just with Teletubbies. I mean, even the models look similar. Next game mode is Infection. This one is my personal favorite game mode because I love how it plays out. There's 12 people on a server and one to three of them are started out infected, and they have to kill the survivors before the time runs out. The survivors are equipped with a deagle and a shotgun, but no melee weapons, so if they run out of ammo, they're good as dead. Now unfortunately, there's not really much of a balance here between the survivors and the infected. Most of the time, the infected will win because of the godly speed and jump height. However, the strength that the survivors have is teamwork. Ticking together in a group, they can easily mow down infected one after the other, but in reality, most games have the players splitting up hunting for kills and not even think of the slightest about teamwork, which is why the infected will win most of the time. Of course, there's the regular old collect and verses, where you can now choose your flashlight and play as the monster, and to be honest, Honest, playing as the monster feels much more fair now. I'm talking specifically about Slinitubbies 2 and 2D. Slinitubbies 2 versus mode was kind of weak, whereas the monster couldn't even kill anyone. I mean, look at Mark here trying to kill his friend in the game. Ah! Did I get you? Oh, come on! Why didn't I get you? Stop moving! Ah! How are you not dead? It's... I'm dodging your, your attack. Where'd you go? Behind oh, you. you are. Ah! Ah! Oh, you missed. Oh, you're not dying. This is a bunch of bull. Ah! Okay. The Teletubby man. You'll never ah! kill me. Ah! I am. I I'll swear. Never let you. I am spamming. Everyone can see that I'm clicking right on him. And oh, I'm killing oh, okay. you. You kill me. Oh, you're dead? You yeah. But while playing versus in the second game is underpowered, 2D is overpowered. There's no time limit in the game, and the way you kill people is being within a radius of the monster. So you can literally just stand on the custard and just stay there and win. But thankfully, Slinitubbies 3's versus is very fair. There's a time limit so the monster can actually win, and the monster has an easy way of killing them while not being too overpowered. Next is Sandbox Mode, which is kind of like Gary's Mod of all things, where you can kind of just do whatever you want. You can free roam as a camera, spawn on like 20 million bosses, have said 20 million bosses fight each other, turn on PvP and kill your friend, etc. The last and most recent game mode is theater, which is some sort of like replay system. My guess is that it's supposed to be for making YouTube videos when you didn't record the footage, so the game does it for you. And that's all the game modes. And despite all the glitches, toxic people, getting kicked for no reason, weird roleplay servers, once you get into a proper match worthy of your time, the multiplayer is a lot of fun, and you should definitely try it out sometime. The Slinitubbies genre is kind of a happy story if you think about it. What started off as something nothing more than a parody of Slenderman became a full-fledged series with its own personality, style, horror, character, development, lore, and community. Zeeworks saw the potential that the first game had and persisted to make more of it with lots of love and passion. And with the new Slinitubbies game, New Worlds, coming out, it seems that the Slinitubbies chapter is coming close to an end. And personally, that is why I think Slinitubbies is a bad but charming masterpiece.